So um, the last presentation of this uh, segment is gonna be about uh, a Dell Enclave that's been made. Um, and in that Dell uh, was able, Dell Giving uh, contributed uh, funds um, in order to host, uh, allow us to host this uh, Dell, uh, Dell Enclave. And essentially what it will do is um, allow us to uh, construct something that we call the digital twin and the process uh, of uh, supporting long COVID for lots of different projects. So that's its kind of immediate goal. I think the, the short-term goal is more, um, or the longer-term goal, I should say, there's an immediate goal, there's a short-term goal, which is to allow various aspects of current projects to uh, be hosted. And then there's a long-term goal, which is as a community resource, we will be able to share the development of this platform in, inside this platform. And if you go to the next slide, what is it that I2B2 Transmart really needs? And that it is it wants to support something called the learning healthcare system. And the learning healthcare system is going to enable clinical trials to be embedded within patient clinic visits in a very similar way that um, we had uh, uh, happening in the NHLBI supported project, but in a more general way. So over the past four, five, six years, it's really become apparent. And I think this is why NHLBI thought that I2B2 Transmart was such a great fit for their program, was that it's really become apparent that lots of different groups are using I2B2 and Transmart, kind of like we just saw in some of the last talks, to host clinical uh, study data and enable that to be analyzed along with EHR data. And those algorithms will definitely be able to then improve healthcare data quality by um, being able to funnel the data uh, into explainable AI, displaying complex analysis processes that processes that will do things like allow reasoning with similar patients, enhance clinical data with genomics and imaging and device data as we've seen. And ultimately, ultimately, we're really looking to make a pipeline that enables algorithms to drive digitally based precision medicine. Next slide. So physically, what does this look like? So physically, it's a box, right? And it's hardware for I2B2 Transmart development. The goal is to assemble a platform for what we call the digital twin. And the digital twin is indeed something that um, captures the essence of what the platform is really intended to do. And that is allow analytics to be performed to help people through contact with their digital twin. And so projects that enable the digital twin will have various areas carved out for development um, such that we can have a lot of different kinds of tools hosted in the digital twin and how they interact with I2B2 Transmart and Picture. And essentially um, it's this funnel, right? Of getting data that starts from the left, going into the, into the enclave box, and thereby enabling APIs to connect to it, but Python, R, uh, uh, SPSS, um, MATLAB, um, lots of different tools be able to participate in the analytics of that um, data. And we can develop these pipelines that will enable uh, data to come from the outside into an I2B2 like happens in probably everybody's I2B2s that currently happen and then go into this pipeline of analytics, which is essentially the model that was used by 4CE. So 4CE really kind of brought this to a, to a focus, I have to say, in terms of what is it that folks in, a, in, in that situation where you really need healthcare to be informed and you need learning to ha be actively happening what's important. And it was this pipeline that was important so that we could get the, the, the data into the hands of, 
of analysts as soon as possible and within a month in the case of uh, the 4CE consortium. So now thinking through, okay, so what will it take to make that process easier and more transportable and transparent so that each uh, hospital or institution can model that kind of data flow for themselves and thereby be able to create this kind of analytic platform to fuel their own learning healthcare system. And as we see later on today in the roadmap for I2B2, how to then allow that to be pulled together into various federated systems so that we can all participate in this learning platform. Next slide. So I'm gonna let Mike start talking about what the architecture of the Enclave is and some of the different areas. And then I'll sum up at the end, Mike. Okay, great, thanks. <clears throat> So, so I'm going to go in depth of both kind of like understanding what this enclave is kind of from the hardware side and also from what you would see if you were a client of it. So right now what we're looking at is the vSphere client. So this is, so as Sean said, this actual hardware, it's Dell hardware, it's PowerEdge 720s. And this enclave that we set up, we're actually utilizing three of those uh, 720s. And what you, what you do is you install this hyper version called ESXi onto each of the hosts. And then that basically, it's basically a modified Linux uh, that allow that then uh, vSphere and Dell modified. And then they developed this vSphere client, which can, uh, connects up to these hosts. And so at that point, if you look on the left-hand side, you'll notice that it has this Enclave 4CE analytics, uh, R cluster, I2B2 Transmod, the Cynthia data set, all of these are uh, virtual machines that are on this um, vSphere. And vSphere has lots of options. It's very powerful. It allows you, it will like, it knows that there's three hardwares. It will then migrate hot, uh, VMs onto other hardwares if one, if one of the hardwares is getting overutilized. Um, it monitors them. It, Etc. Um, so as you see, I kind of broke it into sections, uh, like the analytics section. We have the R cluster. We have uh, this is an older screenshot. There's a GitLab, a Git, uh, GitLab down in there. But then uh, in the servers, we have like an Active Directory. We have a SQL Server. Uh, we have all the Horizon clients so that you can connect up to this enclave. And then the V desktops or the virtual desktops. These are the ones that are created by um uh created by the horizon so that people can connect up and we have both uh a ubuntu and a windows 10. uh snm0 is i was showing sean how to work it and that's his initials <laughs> so <laughs> that's why that and then if you look at the bottom you'll notice that you have these 4 ce ubuntu vdi this uh Ubuntu for Horizon 7 and staging. These are what we call templates. And this is what the Horizon client uses to create the virtual machines that you would utilize. And then on the right-hand side is basically just a look into uh, the actual VM. And if you see how it says launch remote console and launch web console, this would be as if you were like sitting in front of the actual uh, so if it was a, a physical computer, it would be as if you were physically connected there with your monitor connected and your keyboard and mouse connected. So it gives you an actual look at into it. And if there's any errors, for example, if you have a blue screen of desk, you'll see that. And then you can go into actions, restart it, modify it and do what you want. And then and the other nice thing about the vSphere is it shares the memory and the hot and the CPU. So if uh, one person's not utilizing their VM, but someone else is, it will then, and you said, okay, let's say it has uh, 20 cores on, and you allocated 20 cores on both VMs. Um, if one person's not using it, then it will basically give all 20 to the other one. But if they're both using it, then it will basically just share them. Um, same with memory. Uh, okay. So this is a complicated sc uh, screen, but basically what we did was because we want people to utilize this enclave and we need data in this enclave, 
we can't actually use real PHI data. So we use, as some people are, we've talked about, the Cynthia data set. And so we downloaded the Cynthia data set, which is a synthetic data set by MITRE, uh, and it has uh, 1.2 million patients in it. So I, we loaded it into both SQL Server, Postgres, and Oracle, and then we uh, replicated it 10 times, so there's actually 12 million patients in it. And so in the upper right hand corner, then we installed a shrine, a shrine hub and 10 ITB2 shrine nodes. And then we basically created views into those so that it would simulate a, a shrine network with some sites having millions of patients, some have hundreds of thousands. And so I just say from the query that we just quickly did, um, like node one has 2000 while node five has 26,000 patients. And so this will be, I'll be demoing this with Griffin later on today. But on the right hand side here is just basically the um, count of the observation facts for the Cynthia data set for Oracle, the same with uh, SQL Server. And then down here is uh, Postgres. And then kind of in the background is uh, an I2B2 client. Okay. And so this um, is just a screenshot of basically, so we loaded in the latest ACT uh, ontology 4.0, and this is basically just the Cynthia data set with the patient counts. And as you see, there's half a million patients in this one patient set. Okay. Uh, so this is the development area. Am I continuing, Sean, or you? Um, I can I just kind of briefly say, I mean, so uh, in the so we kind of divided things into three sections. And we really built out the development area so far. Uh, we really haven't built out the other section. Um, this whole uh, thing came online just less than a month ago. Mike's done some unbelievable work getting this up, I have to say, and I can't say enough about that. Um, so the um, so setting this up to develop and test I2B2 Transmart tools is what the development area is all about. Um, there's the three database types like Mike talked about, Oracle, SQL Server, and Postgres. Shrine software working on top of it. I2B2 software versions would be hosted. Autologies would be hosted. And of course, Transmart in the future. And then um, all this operates on a series of virtual machines so that it looks natural, right? So people feel like they're in a development environment that's like, you know, just like their desktop, whether they're, uh, whatever they're working on. And, um, and that's, and, and, and a suite of development tools will also be hosted in this environment so that they're available. Um, for for work like Eclipse and so forth. Next slide. And then Mike, go through this. Yeah, so this is kind of now a really kind of uh, an architectural diagram of really what's what's really happening. So if you start with this, the first one, the VM Horizon client. So VM Horizon client is basically it's a client that lets you connect up to a virtual machine remotely. It, uh, it will then control whether you can copy and paste stuff in and out of the virtual machine, whether you can copy files in and out. Uh, there's lots of security around it. Everything's encrypted. Uh, it's what we use in the BioBank challenge and it worked great and it's gonna work great in this environment. So you have an outside investigator who connects up. This is one. Then they get connected to the Horizon agent. And then at this point, then they can choose which, uh, which uh, virtual machines they want. Do they want uh, what they've been allocated to? Do they want a Windows one? Do they want a Ubuntu one? Do they want a SanOS? Uh, whatever's been a allocated. So later on, I'll be showing some screenshots of some Windows one. And so they'll be allocated a Windows environment. And so then at that point, it's in this, what we call this DMZ, demilitized zone. And in this environment, they'll be allocated a VM. And in this VM, there'll be like uh, Python, R Studio in it, SSMS, uh, Juniper Notebook. This is all built onto the virtual machine. And then if you look at two, then they'll, there's other virtual machines in this environment. There'll be like an I2B2 server. There'll be, as Ron talked about, those three databases. There'll be an, um, an R cluster. There'll be a GitLab. Uh, there'll be a, a file area section. And then we have this Isilon 1FS, which is basically a large uh, file server that can be utilized, whether it's for storing imaging data or 
storing uh, processes that you run, everything gets stored on the Isilon uh, database. You typically don't want to run stuff, save stuff on your virtual machine that you've been allocated because, uh, as I said, uh, the vSphere and the Horizon are monitoring it constantly. If they find anything, they might just rebuild it on you. So you always want to save everything on the 1FS. Uh, and then the access point is you can do stuff through your notebook. Uh, but yeah, so this is kind of so this is kind of how it would look. The internal network is the MGB, um, Master General Brigham network. So when we connect up, you'd be connecting to the special DMZ area and not have access to uh, the internal network. Uh, do you want to go over this one, Sean? This is your slide. Just to as we've kind of been showing throughout this entire big morning, the focus is really to go into a lot of these types of data that's not even typical EHR data. It's really, you know, focus on how we can use imaging, how we can use genomics, how we can use IoT, how we can use uh, clinical study data, autopsy data, and so forth. And um, as Victor and Nitch were talking about, um, this is going to be really a, a lot of the focus of being able to create the digital twin. Without all this different kind of data, you can't really have a digital twin that has all this deep phenotyping data. Uh, next slide. Yep. Okay. So then um, here, we're going to go to the next area, which is the one with the eye with a little cross, and that's the secure area. And that's actually where the digital twin will get its data. And so we're really thinking that this is going to host real patient data um, in order to do computation and really create a, a learning healthcare system. Now this whole platform can be recreated in various hospitals and so forth. Let's say we're in India and we wanna understand how do we make a computational platform that performs this kind of surveillance on, but it has to all stay you know, in India because that's what the government uh, mandates. So, Good. So then this whole thing would kind of port into a hospital in, in India and the, and, and the enclave would be stood up there. And But the idea is that it can host real data and real data would be processed. And so this real data area is where we would actually be doing some work at MGB on the digital twins of the patients showing exactly uh, how the learning healthcare system is working. And next slide. So it's place to set up real data for computation. And we are planning on having some biobank data in that area soon to do this kind of real computation. Next slide. So this is kind of a view into the, uh, the Horizon server, the administration. And so this is, uh, I just wanted to show, it's like, okay, you, you see lots of pictures of the, the client side, but this is, this, setting it up on the server side, say one, one, two. So on the left-hand side, you can kind of monitor like the workload. You can see the sessions, how many are running. Uh, in the inventory, you can break it down into like desktops and applications and farms. Uh, the typically is desktop and applications. Um, applications is if you wanted to just allocate certain applications that the, you wanted to show like an ITP to web client or a Transmart client or an Excel, uh, Excel or Word or Outlook, that's what applications are. Desktops, as I mentioned earlier, virtual machines. They're physical and virtual machine, well, virtual, <laughs> virtual machines that either have Windows or uh, Linux on it. And so if you remember earlier, there was like three V desktops. Uh, so these are actually the three uh, des virtual desktop pools. You have the a Windows 10 VDI, this is SNM, uh, Sean's one. And then this was a Windows 10 CE that I was, a 4CE that I was playing around with. Uh, so this is kind of, and then you can go into entitlements and then Alec, this is all connected up to an Active Directory. So uh, you can go into entitlements and say, certain groups can have access to certain ones. And then you can allocate like how many virtual machines are generated at once and whether the users can reboot them how many monitors and you have full control of that aspect. 
So now jumping back to what a user would see. So once you connect up to your virtual, uh, your Horizon client, you log in. This is actually a typical, this would be a Windows 10 view. And as you see, there's a ton of applications already installed. You have like PyCharm, IntelJ, SSMS to connect up to SQL Server. You have uh, PG Admin for the Postgres. You have SQL Developer for Oracle. You have Studio, Juniper Notebooks. Um, Eclipse, Slicer, um, Python, uh, some genomic stuff, ITB to Workbench. So there's a ton of applications that are already installed. And so this kind of gives you a, like a, a beginning to utilize the, there'll be also various different drives that you can connect to. Uh, this, this is your physical, like local drives, but then there'll also be like a home directory. And then there'll be a, one for the Isilon store. So it basically lets you, uh, this is how you connect up and you have lots of tools available at your disposal. Um, and so now we're in the computational area. So the idea is that eventually um, you, we have self-sustaining uh, that we've set up. So, so we've set things up in development, we've ported them into uh, a prod environment and then we have a processing environment that can continuously watch our digital twins. And next slide. running the latest algorithms on the digital twin securely. And uh, this provides, like we talked about a minute ago, a model for hospital use to deploy the computational phenotypes. Next slide. So the actual idea you can see is that data gets collected from the patients. Um, they, uh, it all goes into the digital twin. Digital twin is able to actually provide feedback in a learning healthcare cycle. Um, as well as understanding of um, what patients uh, are actually experiencing and how that figures into uh, new kinds of knowledge that get uh, generated by this um, computational infrastructure. Next slide. And so these continuously running insights on individual patients would allow us to actually uh, implement this idea where we have a learning healthcare system constantly watching patients using much of the infrastructure that you all have developed over the past uh, 15 years. Next slide. And then finally, we have an exchange area that Mike will talk a little bit about, such that, you know, how do things get loaded into new areas and how do files go between areas? Okay, so in the exchange areas, uh, so we're basically looking at using, setting up a GitLab and some type of locked file areas. It'd be like a Dropbox, but something that's within the Enclave. So I started to look at setting up GitLab. So I did install the GitLab into the uh, Enclave. And the idea is that the GitLab would both be accessible probably internally within the Enclave and also externally. We did register the domain dataenclaves.net, which we've been utilizing. So it would be gitlab.dataenclave.net. Um, the GitLab would also be connected up to the active directory. So you just log in and utilize this one, one authentication, single sign-on type of aspect. But yeah, so the GitLab would be the way you could put files, you can keep track of source control. I mean, I, a lot of us are familiar with uh, GitHub, so it's the same idea. It's just, instead of using the github.org, we're actually doing it within the Enclave and everything's saved within the Isilon and then backed up. The other aspect is we were looking at a way to like share large files. And so besides using a Dropbox, we were looking for an open source alternatives. And we just started this. So it's not it's literally like days that I've been working on looking at this. So we kind of evaluated a few open source alternatives. I think the top two are probably more likely. Uh, one is called OwnCloud, which we can sync up uh, data with your like Linux, Mac OS, or Windows. Um, it does end-to-end -end encryption. It's very similar to the Dropbox. It has those type of clients. Um, the, the other one is the next cloud. They claim that they're HIPAA compliant and JDPR for, for privacy compliant. Uh, I haven't looked into what they are. Uh, they include the LDAP Active Directory single sign-on, which is a good feature. Um, 
so it seems like these top two are kind of very uh, robust. They've been around for a while. Um, they have uh, different models, uh, open source model, and they have their own type of um, online on cloud uh, version if you want. Then there's a couple other ones like C file, onion share, and Saito. Uh, these are basically very, uh, it basically does one thing it's just uh, sharing on. Um, sharing files. Um, so I'll take a look at those, but that was basically kind of an idea of future, how we're gonna deal with large data sets and data files. Um, and then as a summary, you wanna do the summary, Sean? Yeah, so just to wrap up. So the community enclave will allow the I2B2 Transmart development of the learning healthcare system. The current use will focus upon the study for the post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infections. We'll automate the flow of data to a broad set of analytic endpoints. And this is really the goal that we have for developing essentially I2B2 Transmart into the future, is using all these tools in a package, um, sometimes called bundles, such that we can get data flowing into the tools that many of you have created um, through the I2B2 Transmart pipeline. We intend to model the digital twin in the data enclave to demonstrate many of the analytics we developed, recover 4CE, picture Transmart applied to real world data. And we expect this to benefit, of course, many other areas. Uh, the models can be ported worldwide. And we, you know, so, so what's in the, think of the, the, the enclave, this, this uh, community enclave more as a, as a development area. It really is more of a development area, testing it on some real world data, but really it's more of a development area that can then be ported and implemented in production at your hospitals or hospitals across the world. So thank you all. We have one question, I believe from Gil. Um, Gil, you can go ahead and unmute. Now, th these are really tremendous developments, team, Sean and team. Um, I'm particularly pleased to see the uh, scheme for in connecting all these data with clinical trial studies because for the amount of effort, we get relatively little out of a clinical trial. It's just typically a uh, one sentence summary with a statistical test on whether a um, therapy or a biomarker gave a positive or useless result. And often it's ambiguous. And the characterization of the patients and the um, fit into all kinds of other important variables is usually difficult or lacking. So I hope there will be a lot of uptake. What is your plan for really getting this mobilized? Well, that's a great question, Gil. I mean, I mean, really, we've long realized, um, and I think the pandemic actually really brought out the implicit value of clinical studies in our hospitals, which you know we focused on EHR data, but when push comes to shove, clinical studies really have the control necessary to answer questions. And so one of the things we've been thinking in terms of is, okay, so the more clinical studies we get in here, the more gold standards we have that maybe we can like compare EHR data and other kinds of data to see, you know, with, with human curated data, how we can derive this, you know, computationally. But, you know, forgetting all that, just being able to implement a pipeline that lets the data flow into the analytic tools that people have developed, I think is incredibly rich. It's really what happens, you know, if you think about how is it that these things really work in life, is that people use I2B2 and Transmart as a, as a way to collect and organize and flow data to analytic groups who then have their tools. And the more obviously that the goal of automating that is great, but before that, just getting the data in an organized and the highest quality data to the groups that do the analytics 
is really, I think, the, the key that, you know, I2B2 Transmart and Picture can, can, can provide. So do, we, do you have any publications already that show how to, to utilize data that could be tapped in a big hospital or a system uh, for interpretation and uh, more detailed uh, explication of the findings of a clinical trial? Um, boy, Gil, that's a big question. Um, I think we've done different like angles of it uh, over over the past you know 15 years. I mean, as you know, you know there's over a thousand publications now that have come mm -hmm. out of ITB doing Transmart, but they're all kind of different parts of the elephant in a way. You know, natural language processing, uh, processing with what my two B two, which is our image analysis platform. You know, everything that's happened, of course, with um, our studies that have been done across the world in I2B2 in various ways and the networks that have been created. But I don't think there's any real like, boy, here's how it was done and here's how we can, you know, pool all the, no all the knowledge and, and, and tools together to create, you know, something that we can really all hang our head on. Yeah, the reason I'm pressing on this is that, yeah. of course, if you start from the EHR and you show all its many uses, that, that's just done over and over and over. Mm -hmm. But if you start from the clinical trial where you have a protocol that has been specified by the sponsor and maybe approved by the FDA without any of these extra resources attached, it's quite often difficult, or at least there's not much interest in making changes in the protocol. They've got enough problems just to execute it. But then they come to the conclusions and they can't explain the findings because so many variables have been neglected. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. Um, yeah, that's something I'd like to talk further with you about. 